for much of its history, half of Canada drove on the opposite side of the road from the other half of Canada. Ontario and Quebec drove on the right side of the road, while British Columbia and the Maritimes drove on the left. When New Brunswick changed sides of the road, the year became wryly known as the Year of Free Beef. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes. With your host and author, Andrew McLean. People have been driving for thousands of years before anyone actually bothered to make a law about what side of the road they were supposed to actually drive on. The ancient Romans preferred to drive down the middle of the road, but when they encountered another wagon, they chose to pass them on their right, simply because most people were right-handed. It was only in 1792, when massive new wagons were being used to transport goods and people, that the first road laws were actually written. France was the first country to pass laws saying which side of the road people should drive on. They simply confirmed the continental European custom, dating back to ancient times, of driving on the right. Britain, however, drove on the left side of the road. Allegedly, this was because back in the Middle Ages, it enabled them to quickly pull out their sword and fight back if they were attacked. You've got to keep that sword hand free in case of bandits on the roads. Britain actually only got around to passing their first road laws in 1835. And they were a pretty narrow set of road laws. It applied specifically to the London Bridge, which was then clogged with congestion. And to make it easier, for the first time, they decided that traffic should officially go on the left on that one specific bridge. That quickly became an informal thing all around the British Empire, and still places like Australia drive on the left today. In 1792, Pennsylvania became the first place in North America to impose a law to drive on the right. And that was once again because those new extra large delivery wagons that were becoming popular, and menaces as well on the road at the time, meant that there needed to be some laws to control these things. Soon after, the independent colonies that would later unite to become Canada followed suit in passing their first road laws. However, these future provinces disagreed on what side of the road to actually drive on. Quebec, with its French history, had always driven on the right. Owing to its early history of being united with Quebec, Ontario also always drove on the right. However, British Columbia, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland all drove on the left because of their close British ties. This was not streamlined during the Confederation debates. It was likely simply not a priority. Roads back then were few and they were in terrible condition, and most long distance travel was done by steamship. There was actually one governor of New Brunswick in the 1840s who would always be accompanied wherever he went on official business by his adult daughter. But when he would go anywhere on longer road trips around New Brunswick, he would ban her from accompanying him. He was worried that she would get injured, including breaking a bone, which was not uncommon, if she drove along New Brunswick's roads. At the time, it would take 24 hours to take a carriage along the roads from New Brunswick to Miramichi. This unique situation in which different parts of the same country drove on different sides of the road remained in place for decades until after the First World War. It was now the Roaring Twenties in the Maritime. The economy was booming and ownership of this brand new automobile was increasing dramatically, especially in New Brunswick. There, the powerful Minister of Public Works, Peter Vino, 
launched one of the most ambitious construction projects in Canada, building a network of 1,200 miles of modern roads and 4,500 bridges spanning the entire province. New Brunswick devoted an incredible one-third of its budget to road construction, the costs of which were recouped in part by a series of levies and taxes on new automobiles. Peter Vino became nicknamed Good Roads Vino. These new roads often meandered through indirect routes in scenic areas. The opposition accused Good Roads Vino of using road construction to buy votes, but these scenic routes made New Brunswick a 1920s hotspot amongst American tourists who were car owners. American car owners, including sports stars like Babe Ruth and silent film stars, flooded the province largely due to the tourism promotion of Fredericton's Doug Black, who understood how to market these new roads to American car owners. In that era of unparalleled prosperity and unbridled consumption, car sales in particular began to take off all over North America. Automobile manufacturers began to promote tourism as a way to sell cars. And Doug Black immediately saw this as an opportunity to promote his beloved province. Doug Black was the editor of the local Daily Gleaner newspaper. And in his spare time, he and his wife Ashley Vavasur spent their free time making homemade promotional materials and corresponding with high profile Americans in the media, sports and political arenas to promote New Brunswick as a beautiful, scenic, and rugged wilderness filled with fascinating animals, people, and places which they distributed through automobile manufacturers. All of these American tourists coming here and spending their money was one motivation that got New Brunswick to change to driving to the other side of the road. They weren't alone, however. New Brunswick and Nova Scotia had agreed to change at the same time, from driving on the left side of the road to driving on the right, which would bring the mainland maritime provinces in line with the rest of North America. However, due to complicated internal political turmoil in Nova Scotia, it disallowed its own legislation after it passed, and that province decided to keep driving on the left. New Brunswick decided to go forward with the change alone. A massive public information campaign was launched to inform the public that the rules would change on December 1st, 1922. The unadorned and functional slogan of the campaign was, Turn to the right instead of the left. The slogan was ubiquitous plastered all over billboards, newspapers, silent film newsreels, and the radio. In a modern sense, this unavoidable slogan became kind of a meme, and it was cut up and it was incorporated by citizens and businesses as a well-known reference, as a pun, and as a joke. St. John's Imperial Theatre urged customers to turn to the right and come into their theatre. C.H. Thomas Taylor's had a Turn to the right, we're cutting our prices right down, sale. Fredericton's People's Benefit Store advertised, Turn to the right goods at the right prices. J.H. Fleming, Fredericton's haberdasher, extolled customers to turn to the right. You won't get left if you purchase your Christmas gifts from us. A Fredericton man wrote a sullen editorial to the Daily Gleaner newspaper lamenting that the right girls had turned to the wrong because young women were too busy drinking and dancing to date him. On December 1st, 1922, the Moncton transcript ran a headline saying, Go slow and turn to the right. The paper reported major delays at the Nova Scotia border as cars and wagons dealt with confusion. In the province's largest city, St. John or seemingly reverted back to ancient Roman times, with the Daily Telegraph reporting, drivers registered complaints about slow-moving vehicles holding to the middle of the street. 
The Daily Gleaner reported no accidents in Fredericton, but it alluded to what would soon become a curious side effect of the change. The chief difficulty so far has been with the horses, which have been accustomed to turn to the left and have not realized their age-old habits must now be changed. Delivery horses, which were left standing by their driver on the right side of the road today, were seen to go to the left side of the road, where they had been accustomed to stand. These public policy changes brought about a curious twist. The year after the road change, when 1923 became jokingly known as the year of free beef. Cars were expensive. Many Maritimers couldn't afford them. The cheaper method of transportation was wagons pulled by oxen. Oxens were, simply put, just not very bright. These famously stubborn beasts had learned to pull their wagons on the left, and they refused the change to turn to the right. It was much easier just to train a new ox to drive on the right than it was to retrain an old ox. Having no use for their old oxen who refused to turn to the right, many were sold to slaughterhouses. Because of the sheer numbers, the price of beef went down. The day after the turn to the right, the wholesale price of beef in New Brunswick was 12 and a half cents a pound. This would be about $2 a pound in today's money. Six months later, it would fall to only three cents a pound. Only one year after New Brunswick's change, Nova Scotia and British Columbia also made the switch. And the year after that, PEI did too. Newfoundland, however, would keep driving on the left until 1947. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.